Can you imagine a creature with the skull of a bear, the teeth of an otter, and the distant ancestor of a seal? That's Colponomos, one of the strangest predators to ever roam the Pacific coast. The origin of Colponomos baffled scientists for decades. Was it a raccoon, a proto-bear, or something else entirely? Its fossils are extremely rare, with only a few specimens existing today, enough to confuse classification, but not enough to provide a definitive conclusion. The first real piece of the puzzle appeared in 1957 when a partial skull and jaw were recovered near Slip Point Lighthouse at Clallam Bay, Washington. At the time, the specimen didn't look especially impressive, just a weathered snout and lower jaw with a few stubborn teeth still embedded. But three years later, paleontologist Reuben A. Sturton examined the fossil in detail and formally described it as a new genus and species Colponomos clalamensis. With only that one fragment to work from, Sturton tentatively placed the animal in the family Procyonidae, lumping it with raccoons and their close relatives. The reasoning was understandable. The rostrum was long and narrow, recalling raccoons, and the teeth, though sturdy, weren't specialized like those of cats or dogs. In the mid 20th century, when classification was based heavily on cranial proportions and dental rows, similarities like these were the logical signposts to follow. Paleontologists didn't have the benefit of more complete skeletal evidence, so they made comparisons to known forms that seemed closest. Under those circumstances, calling Colponomos a raccoon like carnivore was a cautious and defensible move, even if it would later prove incorrect. This early assignment, however, set a pattern that endured longer than expected throughout the 1960s and 1970s. The available literature cited Colponomos as a procyonid, reinforcing the idea that raccoon-like animals had once experimented with unusual diets along the Pacific coast. Because so few specimens were known, this slip point jaw exerted far more influence than it could reasonably support. When a genus is built on one incomplete rostrum, its identity can be skewed for decades until better fossils appear. It helps to understand just how thin the material record really was. At that point, Colponomos was represented by only a handful of fossils worldwide. The first was the 1957 slip point rostrum, followed much later by a nearly complete cranium unearthed at the same Washington site in 1988. Additional material from Oregon would eventually emerge, including bones encased inside a stubborn concretion. But in those early years, none of that evidence yet existed. Paleontologists had only a sliver of jaw and skull to guide them. So the assumptions drawn from it shaped discussions far beyond what one specimen should have dictated. The scarcity of evidence meant important details were missing. Without postcranial remains, no one could evaluate how Colponomos moved, hunted, or fed with more precision. Without a complete cranium jaw, mechanics remained speculative. And in the absence of robust comparisons, the safest path seemed to be grouping it with known raccoon kin. The limitations of the fossil record often force such provisional decisions. It is part of the scientific process. Yet in this case, that provisional label gained the weight of consensus and persisted for years. The consequence was subtle but real. By embedding Colponomos among procyonids, paleontologists of the era folded it into broader hypotheses about the diversification of arctoid carnivores. Rather than revealing the unique adaptations this animal truly had, the early classification blurred its importance, casting it as just another offshoot in the raccoon family tree. For a long time, the unusual features of the skull were thus overlooked or explained away as quirks of a procyonid lineage. Still, science continuously revises itself. What seemed a plausible connection in 1960 came under question as more material surfaced. With new finds, the strange mixture of features in Colponomos would prove impossible to reconcile within the raccoon family. The slip point jaw that once confined it to one lineage had in fact pointed toward a much stranger story waiting to be uncovered. And far to the south along the Oregon coast, that story was about to take a dramatic turn hidden inside an ordinary lump of stone. Near Newport, Oregon, Fossil collector Douglas M. Long found what looked like ordinary concretions 
1969 and again in 1977. Inside them was something far more significant than the most complete colponymos specimen ever discovered. The block of stone seemed unremarkable at first, but its density made preparation incredibly difficult. When the specimens reached the Smithsonian, preparators quickly realized the concretion around the bones was unusually hard compressed by tectonic stress, making it resistant to drills, chisels, and weak acids alike. Extracting the fossil would become a project measured not in months or years, but in decades. For long stretches, progress barely seemed visible. Technicians chipped tiny fragments away under magnifying scopes, inching toward bone surfaces that had to be preserved without damage. They exposed hints of mandible hair teeth, the outlines of vertebrae and ribs only after years of frustrating effort. Even so, they could tell the concretion held more than just scraps hidden within it was a nearly complete skull, a full lower jaw, and portions of the postcranial skeleton. Compared to the modest Washington rostrum, this was an unparalleled resource for understanding colponymos if only the bones could be freed. Over two decades later, patient preparation finally paid off. When the Oregon material was revealed, the impact was immediate. This was no raccoon like skull. Instead, it was a heavy, compact structure built for force. The snout was distinctly downturned, not straight like a raccoon's. The cheek teeth were wide, flat and robust, perfectly engineered for crushing shells rather than slicing meat. The orbits faced forward, granting binocular vision suited to tracking and grasping prey. And the back of the skull showed immense attachment sites for neck muscles, suggesting power not just in biting down, but in wrenching and twisting. In combination, these details represented a profile unlike Proshanids altogether. The specimen eventually described in 1994 by Malcolm McKenna R. Tedford L. Barnes and Clayton Ray was formally named Colponymos newportensis. With its revealing anatomy, the old classification as a raccoon relative finally collapsed. Tedford and his colleagues demonstrated that the Oregon skull placed Colponymos deep among the arctoid carnivores, but not in Proxionidae. Instead, the evidence aligned it with the stem lineage of pinnipeds, the transitional relatives that would later give rise to seals, sea lions, and walruses. This was the critical pivot. The Oregon fossil didn't just refine Colponymos's identity, it completely redirected its evolutionary placement. The reasons for that reassignment were clear once the morphology was laid out. A raccoon skull is light with slicing teeth and little emphasis on leverage. Colponomos nupotensis was the opposite downturned snout. Heavy crushing molars, forward facing eyes for stereoscopic vision and a skull built to anchor massive neck muscles. These were traits consistent with a shoreline carnivore exploiting hard shelled prey, not a tree climbing forager or forest omnivore. The postcranial bones further indicated a coastal lifestyle with limb proportions consistent with a strong weight bearing stance at the land sea margin. None of these details could have been reconstructed from the jaw alone at slip point. Only the Oregon specimen made the ecological picture possible. By showing Colponymos as a stem pinniped, the Newport skull also expanded the known diversity of early pinniped adaptations. Instead of a smooth evolutionary path from land carnivores to fish hunting seals, here was a, a side branch that specialized in shell crushing at the water's edge. It was not a direct ancestor of sea otters, although its ecological role echoed theirs. Rather, it was an experiment in coastal predation that appeared briefly in the Miocene, thriving with its unique toolkit before disappearing. The, the two Oregon concretions found years apart by one determined collector and painstakingly prepared at the Smithsonian, turned a puzzling jaw fragment into a well-understood marine predator. They replaced confusion with clarity, yet they also raised deeper questions. With Colponymos now reclassified and its anatomy uncovered, the mystery shifted from what was it to how did it live? And it turned out that its feeding behavior was so strange that scientists could only explain it by comparing it to two very different animals, one still swimming today and one long extinct. The feeding strategy of Colponymos, nicknamed the oyster bear, was unlike anything living on today's coasts. Biomechanical studies have shown that it developed a sequence of movements designed specifically to pry and crush shelled prey. The method unfolded in three steps. Lock the prey in place with the lower jaw, use powerful neck muscles to torque and dislodge it, and then grind the shell apart with heavy molars. 
This was not speculation. Finite element models of its skull confirmed exceptionally high mandibular stiffness, mechanical adaptations that allowed it to withstand the stresses of wrenching mollusks loose. Durophagy, feeding on hard-shelled animals, is rare among mammals because it requires a blend of strength and specialized anatomy. Fish turtles and even crocodiles have evolved variations of it, but very few mammals have done the same. Sea otters are the modern outlier improvising with four paws and stones to crack their meals. Colponomos lacked such dexterity. Unlike otters, which we observe balancing clams on their bellies and pounding them open, there is no fossil evidence to suggest tool use or human-like manipulation in Colponomos. Instead, all available lines of evidence point to a skull and neck adapted as the primary instruments of capture and processing. The extraction phase was particularly distinctive. Anchoring prey with canines against rocky surfaces, Colponomos would then drive its body into the problem, a sudden twist of the head and a pull of the neck yanked mollusks free. Biomechanical models revealed that in this prying stage, the structure of its jaws converged strikingly with that of Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat. Both displayed a deep mandible, tapering backward and broad sights for muscle attachment across the skull base. Although they hunted entirely different prey, Smelodon, opening flesh, and Colponomos, detaching mollusks, the underlying mechanics of torque and anchoring were astonishingly similar. This was functional convergence across ecosystems between a marine mollusk crusher and a terrestrial predator of megafauna. Once the food was dislodged, Colponomos transitioned to crushing mode. Here its cheek teeth did the work smashing through thick shells that protected clams and crabs. Yet even this phase carried clues about its adaptation in contrast to sea otters whose jaws show lower stiffness but greater efficiency at crushing colponomos combined high stiffness with relatively low efficiency. That trade-off implies it was built not for rapid chewing but for withstanding repeated punishing stresses from cracking very tough shells. Its skull was less of a nimble nutcracker and more of a reinforced vice designed to endure the cost of such meals across a lifetime. The efficiency losses mattered little in practice because shellfish do not run leap or evade. What Colponomos required was resistance to fracture, not speed. Day after day, it could twist mollusks, free position them between its molars and grind them down. The method may have been slower than an otter smashing prey open, but it was reliable and it was encoded in anatomy rather than behavior. In this sense, Colponomos represented a very different solution to the same dietary challenge, a marine carnivore that carried its tools in bone and ligament rather than hands. Framing it in a simple contrast helps capture the uniqueness an otter attacks a clam with dexterous hands and a borrowed stone. Colponomos used jaws like clamps, prying with saber tooth like mechanics before finishing the job with molars as broad as pestles. Neither strategy was right nor wrong. They were parallel experiments that solved ecological challenges in equally effective but anatomically divergent ways. Calling it the oyster bear underlines both the heft of its skull and its dietary specialization. Few mammals of comparable size would commit so thoroughly to shellfish, but Colponomos did. It bent the carnivore blueprint to its needs, combining the leverage of terrestrial hunters with a coastal forager's menu. In doing so, it created one of the most unusual feeding systems known from the Miocene. And that leads naturally to a bigger question. If Colponomos evolved such an elaborate strategy, why did it appear in the Pacific Northwest at that particular time and not somewhere else entirely? In the early Miocene, the Pacific Northwest coast offered a distinctive stage. Kelp forests surged against rocky outcrops, the tide pools overflowed with mussels, barnacles, clams, and crabs, and yet very few predators could breach the armor of these hard-shelled invertebrates. Large marine mammals were already present, whales branching into filter feeding herbivorous, desmostylians crowding estuaries and primitive pinnipeds chasing fish, but none had the skulls or jaws required for breaking through shells. The result was an open ecological vacancy, a gerophagus niche waiting to be filled. Colponoma stepped into that niche. Its lineage traces back not to fully aquatic pinnipeds, but to terrestrial arctoid carnivore relatives of early raccoons and bears that independently shifted their feeding strategy toward the nearshore zone. 
Unlike seals or sea lions, which inherited adaptations for life in water from pinniped ancestors, Colponomus was a separate experiment that adapted a land mammal skull for a coastal task. The innovation was not gradual absorption of aquatic traits, but a direct response to the abundance of mollusks clinging to rock. This adaptation placed Colponomos among the earliest large endothermic predators to reliably exploit shelled invertebrates in the North Pacific. The coastal environment itself shaped the opportunity. Instead of the broad sand beaches most of us imagined 20 million years ago, the shoreline bristled with outcrops and tidal basins. Rocks were carpeted in mussels and barnacles, while kelp anchored thick mats that supported dense invertebrate colonies. Those resources were effectively locked away. A typical carnivore could chase fish or scavenge carcasses, but without the ability to crack shells, the molluscan feast went untouched. Colponomos, by combining stiff jaws and immense bite force, turned that untapped living larder into a steady source of calories. Few competitors overlapped with it, so once this adaptation emerged, it occupied the space with little challenge. Its role becomes easier to appreciate when compared with distant analogues. Sea otters represent one modern solution, dexterous paws, and the behavioral ingenuity to use stones as hammers. Walruses illustrate another massive tusks to extract bivalves and a powerful tongue to create suction. Colponomos took a path distinct from both, but aimed at the same resource. It anchored its prey with strong canines, twisted it away from rock with neck torque, and crushed it with molars reinforced by bone. That durophagus strategy positions Colponomos in the lineage of North Pacific innovations, noted by researchers like Girat Vermage, who emphasized this region as a crucible for novel predation systems. This independence makes Colponomos remarkable. It was not a half-formed seal, nor a primitive otter, but a terrestrial carnivore that converted its skull into a specialized tool set. The experiment shows how mammals can reach for new resources when circumstances allow. Abundant prey, little competition, and a shoreline architecture rich in shellfish created the conditions. The payoff was a medium-sized predator solving a problem most others ignored. For scientists, these adaptations matter as much for what they represent as for what they achieved. Colponomos demonstrates how evolution often proceeds as improvisation. When no prior model exists, a lineage can invent new traits to seize ecological space. It was not a stepping stone towards something more advanced, but an evolutionary trial one that succeeded briefly and then disappeared. The few fossils we have capture that improvisation, a skull and jaw robust enough to define an animal unlike anything else in its ecosystem. That scarcity makes every specimen significant. Each fragment recovered from Washington or Oregon offers a glimpse of a creature that filled an empty role in a crowded coastal food web. Colponomos thrived not in great numbers or vast ranges, but in carving out a lifestyle no other predator dared attempt. Its bones remind us that even in oceans full of whales, sea cows and early seals, there was still room for a small arctoid mammal to reshape the rules. And it is from those scattered pieces of evidence that we begin to see the broader lesson that reaches beyond Colponomus itself and touches on how we understand the strange, unpredictable routes evolution can take. Colponomos is more than a rare fossil hidden in Northwest Stone. It shows how dramatically science can shift with new evidence. The discovery and preparation of the Oregon concretions, which revealed a nearly complete K. Newportensis skull and jaw, overturned the raccoon hypothesis and placed Colponomos near the stem of pinnipeds. It became a textbook example of how one specimen can rewrite evolutionary history. Colponomos reminds us that evolution experiments repeatedly and that each new fossil has the power to overturn long-held ideas. If you enjoyed following this fossil detective story, like and subscribe for more rediscoveries that change paleontology and tell us below which part surprised you most.